Hi, welcome to another WCET one-on-one -on -one interview. Today we have a great friend of ours, Patricia James, who was formerly on our executive council and just continues to be involved in many important initiatives in California. So let me go ahead and have Pat introduce herself. Hi, uh, I'm Pat James, and um, I've been involved with the California Community College distance education efforts for two decades or more. <laughs> and um, I'm now doing a lot of consulting for the colleges, and I'm also working for American Public University in providing um, partnerships between a on fully online university and our college's online programs. And that's what I'm doing now. Um, Great. Well, you've had a lot of experience with moving courses online and institutions adopting a, a single LMS. So talk about in the face of a coronavirus outbreak, and it looks like it's continuing to grow and become more of an issue for many of our institutions in our states. What are some tips that you have for helping institutions prepare and consider moving from a face-to-face -to, -face to a hybrid or an online environment? Okay, well, we started this effort actually after the fires uh, in Northern California two years ago, and we're, some of this, and then last year as well, and some of the colleges were closed for more than two weeks, and that's a really hard thing to make up. So we were trying to figure out if a college has to close for some reason, can we put our face-to-face -face courses online and still maintain the compliance that we need in order to uh, satisfy our accreditation needs and also just to offer um, a good experience for students? And so we've been really talking about that in the last uh, two weeks around this uh, a possible pandemic, and it is coming to it is in California and particularly uh, Sacramento and a couple of other places and we're worried about what we're going to do. So in the efforts around the fires, we needed a survey to find out uh, where everybody was, who was available to work, keep track of people. And we, we thought, well, you know, our, our LMS, we use Canvas, is statewide and why not use that to send out surveys? And then, and it's a, so it's a two-way thing rather than just an alert that you send out something, but you don't necessarily get anything back. Mm -hmm. And so we thought if we used our LMS, that would be one way to get that two-way interaction. And then what would have to happen around that if we were going to use it just for that purpose? Um, and there are a couple things we'd have to make sure that everybody is aware that we're going to use it, that our Canvas administrators can post announcements um, in, you know, that are coming through the system and not just in a class, which is, if you go to your dashboard, it's there. So we're fortunate that way. Um, and get them prepared and have things prepared in advance, the surveys, the messages, all of that stuff already planned, written, ready to go in any emergency. So that's one of the things that we thought we'd have to do. We're still working on trying to implement, but that's one of the things is getting everybody prepared. Um, and in that scenario, faculty and staff and students would all have to have a profile set so that they could receive information. And, and they just go to the dashboard, so it's really not a huge thing, um, except their email has to be accurate. Um, so those preparations would need to be made in advance. But then when you start to think about taking the classes from a face-to-face -face environment and putting them online, now you're talking about making sure that all the compliance issues are solved. And so one of the things that we thought we could do is provide a template for the faculty that go in the face-to-face -face, um, courses, all of them, and the faculty fill it in with what they need at the time, and it's unpublished until it's needed. So their faculty who are not familiar with using the LMS and the way our online faculty are could um, actually have something to follow and provide them with everybody with some self-paced training around the compliance measures that are needed in order to um, take a class from a face-to-face -face environment to a partially online. Because if you're thinking about it as a hybrid or a partially online class, you're recognizing that this is not forever. You know, this is maybe for a week or two weeks, or you know, it could be a little bit longer in the face of what we're seeing right now. But if we prepare people appropriately and we support our faculty 
So they're not freaked out by it. And they understand that this is the minimal thing that they have to do. Um, you know, that they have our regular substantive inter interaction, you know, that they're, that they're um, making sure that the student that's taking the class is the student and those kinds of things that we know we have to do and providing the same content as they would if they were um, providing it on the ground. Those things, we just train people on this kind of minimal use, but keeping them compliant. So we ha I have a list that I put together, but they're, the distance ed coordinators are working on fleshing out more of a robust plan. And so that's what we're thinking about right now, you know, making sure everybody's prepared, using the tools we have, which for us is Canvas, um, and, you know, providing faculty with the resources they need to be able to move a class quickly from a face-to-face from -a -face environment to an online environment. So you're saying that with the course having a online component, it's still in compliance because only that duration of the time where you're not able to operate face to face, that portion would be the hybrid portion. So right. you're still in compliance that way. And we have reached out to the Department of Ed as well as our friends at NASFA, the financial aid folks, so that we can get direct guidance from the education. So we're yeah. waiting on that. I'm sure they're getting hit left and right and we have a lot of requests, but we'd like to have some messaging that we can share with our membership community around that. Well, one of the things we have to do is to, is to you know, really identify what we consider as an emergency and that this would only be in the event of an emergency that this approval would work. And in California, you have to have, according to our regulations, separate approval. You have a course outline that's approved through the curriculum committee, but then you have to have separate approval for a distance ed um, approval, either an addendum or whatever you use. But the, the colleges in, in our system can decide what that process is. So if they decide that, a, that this process I'm talking about um, in an emergency situation with that defined is enough for partially online, then that should satisfy our regulation. Mm -hmm. The part that has to satisfy accreditation is are we doing the compliance measures for quality online that, that, that the Federal uh, Department of, Educa of Education requires us to right. do. And it's also our regulations as well. Um, so there's a way to do that. You know, I, there's no um, distinction between fully online and hybrid anywhere that I've ever seen. So it's not in the federal regs. It's not in our own regulations. It's just mm -hmm. distance ed. So if you're switching over to distance ed, you know, then if you know how to stay in compliance, you should be okay. The issue comes when you're, is it more than a certain amount? Because for us, for our accreditors, if it's over 50% of a program that's online, then, um, you know, both time and content, then um, that has to be, you have to submit a report for that, that goes into a different category for us. Um, but I think in an emergency, we ought to be able to, to switch over, do it well, keep people educated, and not lose a lot of time. Right, right. I, I know that if we're planning for natural disasters and things along those lines, we should be able to operate accordingly through something like this. So I know my brother, he was a senior in college down in New Orleans when uh, Katrina hit. And they were able to quickly move him to his sister campus in Chicago. So there are plans and we can make things work. But along those lines, just compliance is one major concern on the face of, um, you know, an a, a approaching pandemic. But there are major financial implications to be considered as well as, you know, many of our institutions are serving students predominantly face to face. And what does that look like to do the online and then on the flip side, the students, many of them might not have a computer at home and they're trying to then adapt to doing their studies on their phone via yeah. or 5G network. So, yeah. and that's, future. you know, and that's, yeah, that's hard stuff. Um, as far as the cost is concerned for the college, for our colleges, it, I don't think it would be a lot of cost because we already have unlimited use of our LMS. So we wouldn't have a big mm -hmm. cost issue there. Um, providing the training materials, creating those 
would incur some costs, um, although we have a lot of them already. Um, you know, we would just have to sort out which things, pe which things people need, you know, and not everything that we do for training. We do a lot of professional development uh, through our At One project, but it would, it would have to be, you know, specified. We just take out the specific stuff that we need and make that available. Um, for students, again, we have, you know, we happen to have an LMS that has a good uh, mobile presence. And, you know, hopefully that would, that would work. What I noticed from WCET last year was uh, Western governors, they track their students. Where are their students? Where do they live? And they put together some particular supports for students that are like in California fires or in situations. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that that's probably the next step is, is knowing where our students are right. and what their needs are so we can help them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, and cost to me, I don't see it being a huge cost to do this. You know, not in our system. It may be for right. other people, but right. I don't think it would be for us. And the, again, the pre-planning, making sure everybody knows what's going to happen, being ready for that, you know? Having your business continuity plan. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of the students, what about students that rely on some in-person student services? Is, have you seen a successful move to online student service? Yeah, well, you have to do that, right? Um, one of the things our accreditors tell us is that we have to provide the same resources for our online students as we do for our face-to-face. -face. Right. So the OEI, the Online Education Initiative, CBC OEI, have put to, we put together a whole set of tools for online counseling, online tutoring, just-in-time support mechanisms for um, students who have problems with writing or math or whatever. Um, you know, proctoring and plagiarism detection and all that is available to all of the colleges in our system. So we have that support mechanism set up. Um, one of the things that I think we're learning is that it's not about, you know, only certain students can take online classes. It's about access and that's for everybody. So we have to figure out how all of our programs work for all of our students mm -hmm. anyway. Right. Yeah. What about international students? Um, we don't have a lot, I don't think. There are some in California. Uh, there are a few colleges that have a lot of them, but I don't see that as being a huge problem either. I mean, there are students, right? Um, why would that be a lot different other than they can't take a lot of courses online? Is that what you were thinking? Or Yeah, we've had some questions from our membership specifically about international students and uh, compliance issues around continuing to serve them and modifications to programming, that type of thing. But you're right, if you're already planning to serve those students, then that should be within your normal business operations. And I would, you know, I would probably go back and ask um, Amer the folks at American Public, for me, I'd go, uh, and I'm going to now go back and ask them, you know, what they would consider, but they're 100% online, so you know, it's a little bit different. There is a really good website at Georgetown University for um, continuity of instruction and a shutdown. I'll send you that link. I'll have to go get it, send it to you so you can get it out to people. Um, and there is also a resource that has websites from a variety of universities that are dealing with, you know, how they keep the continuity of instruction going. Um, my story from Katrina was that I was um, doing some instructional design for Emory and I was talking to the IT person there and he said that they helped um, oh I'm trying to think of what the name of the university is I'm sorry um, in in um, New Orleans Tulane yay <laughs> not that old <laughs> Tulane that they worked with Tulane to take their classes and host them you know, host among servers that they were, that they held in Atlanta. And I think that, you know, that's kind of the next step. If we have a college that can't actually even host their own classes for some reason, um, you know, in our system now, because we have one system that serves everybody and it's, you know, and it's on Amazon servers, it's not even in the state, I think we'd be okay. But, 
you know, what about if you can't even host your own classes and you're doing that and you need some support from somewhere else. And if you think about it, you, you know, years ago, we were trying to keep our websites up. We'd have them, you know, we'd have them hosted by somebody else, not near us, just so mm -hmm. we could switch over to an alternate website. You know, um, our, we lost our databases for Blackboard once during spring break, <laughs> trying to back it up, go figure. And, <laughs> um, and so I was asked then as a faculty DE coordinator to provide something for our, for our online classes. And so I did a template website um, that faculty could just go and fill in for the one week <clears throat> that we were down while we were reconnecting all the pieces. But it taught me a lot about pre-planning and um, yeah, that experience and what we've dealt with with the fires. Um, you know, I think we need plans at every college. Um, I've worked with two that put together as part of their DE plan, um, some disaster planning that includes what if you have a faculty member die in the middle mm -hmm. of a term, what do you do? You know, do you have intellectual property rights in the way? Have you really thought about that? You know, there's way more to disaster planning because I would consider that a disaster. And, um, you know, how do you keep that going? It's really, again, about the continuity of instruction. I think, you know, you have to think about it. You need to sit down and have it a, have a plan. Right, right. Well, and this we're going to need it. Good motivation for those that haven't revisited their plan in a little while. And the WCET community, our listserv is a great place to share these resources. There's no need for anybody to recreate anything or start fresh. You know, we have lots of collaborative conversations going on there where people can share these resources and ask for help. So yeah, it's great participating. So Pat, I, I know you're limited on time and we are greatly appreciative of you carving out some time this morning. Do you have any other advice or guidance for our members? Um, I think that our, our DE coordinator, uh, the president of our DE coordinators association, Lisa Beach, um, said the other day online, she said, you know, whatever you do, make sure that you're supporting your faculty. And I think that that's really um, critical to any plan that you have you mm -hmm. know, that you're supporting. If you're asking faculty to do something new or different, that you're really supporting them. Right. Okay. So. And supporting our students. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Okay. Well, it's about sure. the students, right? Right. I had a T-shirt made, by the way, that on the front of it says it's all about the students, and on the back it says it's not about you. <laughs> right. That's your I haven't had the lifelong motto. I love it. I haven't had the guts to wear it yet, but maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Well, thanks again, Pat. We appreciate your time. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Bye.